Philip, and uh, I'm a student at Oregon Health and Sciences University studying uh, acoustic anomaly detection. And uh, I am also um, a, an employee of Happy Whale, which does unique whale identification uh, or individual whale identification. Um, and uh, I'm also, uh, for the past year, been spending a lot of time in top modeling. Um, in the case of this talk, I'm going to be emphasizing work with uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab and uh, with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, but also through the past few months, I've been uh, using topic modeling in uh, clinical trial organization tasks. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit as well, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess this is, uh, I'll, I'll get started on this. Um, the, the major machine that we'll be talking about in this talk is uh, the latent Dirichlet allocation model and then derivatives of that model. But um, this talk is, is supposed to be designed such that you don't have to have a deep statistics background. And so I'm trying to use terms that are uh, more accessible than, than uh, the statistical terms. Um, uh, additionally, if you want the full form of this presentation, it is linked to on the meetup, which uh, has a bunch of extra slides and information. Um, so. so for this talk, we're going to discuss what is topic modeling and then why bother topic modeling. Uh, and then we're going to have a brief introduction to generative models. Um, and then understanding this model space a little better uh, for topic models in generative modeling. Um, or generative modeling in topic models. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about um, after latent D or Schley allocation, what are the machines that are very similar, that, are, uh, that you can use similar evaluation metrics for, and, and how you might be able to leverage those machines for actual uh, products. Uh, so, so let's start with what topic modeling is. So this is a uh, the task of topic modeling is to take a large collection of data and automatically infer uh, clusters of that data that are uh, that have commonly shared traits and and, and in the most common uh, instance of topic modeling we are concerned with making sure that or that with a large text document collection we're able to identify what are the themes that are discussed in that collection and so as an instance, um, you may have a bunch of news articles, some of them about guns and some of them about animals, and there might be some overlap where there's uh, stuff about uh, hunting. Um, and you would say that there may be two topics in this topic collection, and then uh, some documents are about only one of those topics and uh, other documents are uh, of a mixture of the two topics. So. We have a little bit more of a concrete example here. Um, so for this case, I have three documents. Um, and the um, highlighted words denote topics that I have uh, hand labeled for these documents. We have food, travel, and time. And you can see that from this annotation, we know that documents two and three are about food and time. Now, whether these documents topics are the best descriptors for these documents uh, is definitely open to debate. Um, but uh, as an illustrative example, this kind of tells you what the statistical model is trying to generate, um, is, is this automatic, uh, automatic uh, grouping of documents by theme. And the idea that themes can be, you, uh, each document can have multiple themes and have some sort of a shared uh, descriptor. Do you have a notion of the types of themes you're trying to explore, or are you just going to discover things on the way in, and you might end up with a surprise about themes? So with uh, traditional latent Dirichlet allocation, you do not have a prior on what your themes could be. Um, there are uh, alternatives to, to LDA, like uh, supervised LDA, where you do have some themes that you label ahead of time. Or um, in the case of what my project was, I did author topic modeling where um, I didn't necessarily know what the themes were, but I had a prior saying that um, experts of a topic are more likely to write about that topic. And so experts act as a, um, uh, a, a grouping uh, criteria, something that, that, that adds prior information. 
Um, in the case of the clinical trial data that I'm working with, um, I actually am uh, boosting named entities, uh, their importance in um, the documents. And so what we're saying is like, uh, I run a named entity recognizer over my text. A named, uh, a named entity recognizer oh. is the is a is a program that will identify what are places and what are people and what are medicines and what are suppliers like that. Yeah. yeah, so it's like a classifier across your text document. And what you can do is you can upweight certain words and you can shape your topics based on this upweight. And so that's supervision. Yeah, so okay. that so it's kind of like a semi-supervised or self-supervised uh, learning model from that perspective. And it would sound really stupid, but when I looked at what Dureshla, what the heck is that? So would you say that Dureshla is like just Bayesian on steroids, or is it a completely different thing that's only intersecting with it? Uh, so Dureshla allocation is a Bayesian model, a Bayesian generative model. Um, the, um, there, so, but the Dureshla distribution itself is just a distribution on distributions. Uh -huh. um, and so if you, for instance, what we do in this case is we represent each document as a multinomial distribution. So that's to say that the occurrence of the word uh, cat happens five times, and then I normalize and I say, well, maybe there were five cats and there were uh, 10 dogs. And so my cats are at 0.5 and my, or uh, whatever, I guess 0.2. Uh, now I'm going to do math in my head. Uh, yeah, that's uh, no, 0.33 <laughs> and 0.66 for my cats and my dogs. Um, and so now I can represent my, my document as a multinomial distribution, and then I can uh, uh, say, what is the distribution of all of my documents? Um, and and be able to do the mathematics on that afterwards. That, that yeah, so that, that was really interesting, because I saw it was multivariate, but it's distribution on distribution is very illustrative of what we're looking at. Yeah, and I have some more uh, illustrations later on in the talk that should help with that as well. Excellent. Any uh, questions on the uh, on the other side? <laughs> Any online? Oh, this is an oh, that was, yeah, intro. That's from Al. We can go over that at the end. Okay. He says nope. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that we can solve with topic models, uh, we can ask questions like uh, find the similarity between doc document pairs. Um, you can also find similarities between uh, themes or topic pairs. Um, you can also uh, cluster documents. If you can find similarities, then you can take groups of documents and say, you can use some metric and say that these are close enough in uh, pairwise to have produced a, uh, a group, a collection of documents. And usually this is what's being done. Uh, maybe not necessarily this uh, machine, but this is the strategy that's being done when you go to a search engine and you have something like you click on uh, news or you click on like mm -hmm. finance. Uh, and it gives you a list of uh, articles that are recent that happen to have a shared theme. And this is how those themes are usually extracted. Are people using this one commercially a lot? This approach? Uh, this approach, yes. Okay. Um, this is, there are a lot of different approaches. Uh, topic modeling as an approach in general, they are people using a lot. Mm -hmm. um, this, um, when you, yeah, so the, the type of topic modeling you end up electing becomes very domain specific and, and uh, often the biggest constraint is how much uh, memory or, uh, uh, or time you can spend training these models. Luckily, latent Dirich day allocation is relatively fast and has both an online and an offline uh, training model. Yeah. So you can, if you want to have a low memory profile, you can use an implementation that leverages a, a technique called variational inference, um, which you don't have to know what it does, so you just have to know it exists. Um, and then if you want a faster model, uh, but have, ex but have uh, the ability to use more memory, then you can use a technique called good sampling. And that's been uh, very uh, well tested and, and explored as well. So, uh, what was that called? Good sampling? Good sampling. Good. In your research, are you, do you tend to run things on, on one machine, or are you renting space somewhere to, to Everything run? Everything on my laptop. So that's yeah. really efficient then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't work with, uh, well, so for my, my, my research research, I'm doing um, uh, audio anomaly detection and that I'm doing a couple of different things. Okay. But, um, but for this work, I'm doing everything on my laptop. Yeah. And, and uh, topic modeling I've found usually doesn't require huge amounts of memory unless you're gonna do um, a, 
in you know, like an in core modeling solution, and then it's very dependent on the size of your corpus. Um, okay. But if, but for instance, with the JPL project, I had um, I think uh, maybe ten thousand documents per um, uh, per document type that I was modeling, and I was only looking on that. So, um, so it's probably going to get to the order of millions that you need to be a little bit more concerned. So here's kind of a, oh wait, did I get all of those things? Uh, oh, the shapes. Yeah, that kind of really cool. yeah, so exploring the shape of a document collection, that's kind of like if you have no idea what the prior document themes are, then this is a tool that allows for you to just uh, infer those uh, themes. And then there's a, a task of having humans read those and then try to figure out what they actually mean. But uh, it turns out that this model performs in a way that is uh, fairly human intuitive especially if you use um, a certain different types of evaluation metrics for your model. Um, have, you, have you ever had a surprise with a shape or do you ever find emergent phenomena with shape exploration? Uh, so I've definitely found usually these surprises are, well, okay, so here's a, so there, there's a surprise from the JPL data set that I found um, where um, there was a, a, a set of documents that were being, um, well, one of the things we found out was that about 40 years ago, the uh, document collection that I was working on, uh, before I got access to the document collection, obviously, but about 40 years ago, uh, a lot of these documents were hand typed over from, um, from the handwritten versions to like the computer version. And um, these, uh, and so all of these people had all of these documents of the same authors that had a bunch of like weird like uh, properties that uh, so what I think the, the the interesting anomaly found was that there's definitely some data we were able to quickly identify what data in the data set was not should not be included in our training set and should not be included in our model because it had some very peculiar um, biases and a lot of um, legacy information that wasn't was no longer applicable. And did you see that by getting this weird lump that you saw on the shape and oh, what the heck is this? And yeah, so okay. I, like, I plotted it out in, a, in an interesting way and, I, and then I, I noticed that my train and test set both acted in this very peculiar way uh, after having trained the model and, um, and, and then made the, the I, I assumed that there was a problem with legacy information because the amount of information we were dealing with was, was so old, or that the, the age of the information we were dealing with spanned from like within a week to within eight years or whatever, whenever JPL was started, I don't remember. <laughs> but, um, but I assume that that would have been one of the problems. And you, you might have even find weird shapes from methodologies as they change over time too, because their they're study and their approach is going to be different. Yeah, and so more advanced models, latent your slate allocation is the simplest of these models but it's more like a model class, and it's a good way to think of it that way. There's a, uh, a, another model called the CTM, the Correlated Topic Model, and the Correlated Topic Model um, uh, makes the assumption that, uh, that not all topics are independent of each other. And so you get these, uh, you can get nested topics. Um, and so, or you could look at, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, hierarchical Dirichlet processes, which allow for you to get a hierarchy of topics. Um, and so there's a lot of different strategies in applying this, this general uh, case study, this general case of topic. You said something was really interesting that, that, that we're making an assumption that not all these topics are independent. So in this model, are we assuming that things are pretty independent? Yeah, topics ah. are considered independent, but documents can have multiple topics. Okay. So documents are not independent, but topics are. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that all of the words are independent, though. That's to show like a word can occur in both topics, but their oh, uh, topics generation. Is independent. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. So, um, so here's our uh, visualization of kind of this this space that we're in. We have our three topics: our uh, travel, or I guess. Um, so I have three three words. Originally, you, you express your document as a. Um, uh, originally, you express your document as a distribution over the words of that document, so like a multinomial distribution. We would say that, uh, for instance, this up here has a lot of occurrences with the word trains, 
and this down here has some very few occurrences of the word trains, but might have a much more occurrences of the word tourist, depending on where you put your zero axis, which I forgot the label. Uh, <laughs> is dimensionality a new word or is that a, a typo? Uh, dimensionality, where down on the bottom on the left side figure, dimensionality, is that something? Uh, dimensionality, I, so dimensionality as in the number of dimensions that you express your okay, document. Got it, okay. Um, and so I just can't spell. Yeah, yeah sorry. It's possible <laughs> that I spelled it wrong. Too. That's, uh, I'm not a great speller. I, I use computers to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so strictly <laughs> natural language for us. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in this in this example, we have a, a document that is uh, three dimensional, and we can assume that all of our documents in our space are three dimensional, and then we can reduce it using a, a topic model where we specify that there are only two topics, and that is our dimensionality reduction task, and that is what this latent Dirichlet space is learning. Uh, and then once we have our documents in this reduced space, it's much easier to make uh, clusters as are labeled with these colors or it's much easier to measure distance between documents because you reduce a lot of the noise associated with being in these high dimensional spaces and you can also limit the effects of, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, oh dear, I'm losing my words. The outlier? Or no, when, when you have too, too many dimensions, your, your cursive dimensionality. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, Recursive dimensionality? The, the, the cursive Curs dimensionality is, that, is oh. that when you have things in too high dimensional space, that distances become meaningless. Um, and so in this case, latent Dirichlet allocation reduces the dimensions of your documents to a topic space. And that topic space uh, is that because in a lower dimensionality, the, the distances are more meaningful. Um, and then- Hello, this is Michael, well, just saying hello. Oh, hey, Michael, thanks for joining. Michael. I'm remote, I'm in a car. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so the, and, and then in this case, we would say that topic one, which has no label, is uh, constructed by some combination of words, which is represented by this multi -level. And this would be the contribution of each word to that topic. Um, and so one of the things that's hard about a lot of these topic models is that they don't actually give you a word that says, this is about sports or this is about finance. They instead give you a list of words that are the, uh, the highest ranking words of that distribution. And then you, as a reader, have to look at those and determine whether those are useful. Um, so let's talk about a generative model. Um, so for generative models, what we're doing is we come up with a way to describe how a document or how something was generated as a uh, set of probability distributions and their interactions. Um, and then we fit their parameters in order to, uh, or we fit our parameters on the observed data in order to um, uh, be able to produce new documents, for instance, in that model, or be able to ask questions about um, how likely a, a document was to have existed, or to be able to ask anything about our latent variable space, which is like, uh, uh, what are the uh, topics that create this document? It, it is the distribution over the topic? Yeah, so, okay. the, so there's a, there's a latent Dirichlet distribution is over the topics. There, there are Dirichlet distributions over the topics and antinomials are over the words. And so um, you'll find that topics are distributed over words and documents are distributed over words. And well, the Dirichlet distribution is over the, uh, doc, over the, uh, the multinomials describing the documents. And so it gets a little complicated. Yeah, my ears are bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> like hierarchy is kind of it's kind of like okay. uh, I think that it'll become more okay. more obvious when we get to uh, the next slide. Yeah. So uh, but effectively these generative models um, uh, instead of discriminative models are trying to describe how documents are generated, you fit values and because you fit these values by uh, describing the generation process then if you have a step in your generation process that's unobservable, you can often uh, infer probably new values out of that regardless. Um, so um, what we'll see here, again, another representation, and this is one that I actually ended up drawing out because it was hard to find one uh, that really described everything. Um, the, uh, the, the generative model for Leighton Dirichlet allocation says that each document, uh, as denoted by uh, the documents on the bottom right here, 
um, gets mapped into this Dirichlet distribution. The Dirichlet distribution is described as the, um, the topics X, Y, and Z, and the uh, vocabulary space we're working in is A, B, C, D, E. Ah, okay, got it. So, for instance, the topic Y describes very little A, a lot of B, and a lot of E. And the topic X describes a lot of A and maybe some B and some C. So you can see visually what each of these points on the Dirichlet distribution are, are describing. And then every document will be a sample, or what, every document is then described as a multinomial distribution, just like these topics are. Is your, is your topic distribution coplanar with the word distribution here, or is that just completely uh, independent dimensionally? They are, uh, okay, sorry, can you repeat that? Is the topic distribution, uh, the, the three-pointed uh, figure, uh, code coplanar with the, the word distribution, the five variables, or is it completely independent and it just happened to be drawn on the same Yeah, it just, it just happened to be drawn on the same So way. it's independent. That yeah, is yeah. cool. Yeah, so you, usually what you're doing is you're dealing with uh, like 50,000 dimensions for your vocabulary space right, right. and then maybe 60 dimensions for your topic space, okay. but drawing that is very hard. So most of the shine Dirichlet distributions are drawn as three as, as a three topic mm -hmm. dimensional projection. Um, and so that's why I ended up using that here. Um, but we can express every document as a multinomial, just like we were describing these topics as multinomials. And then uh, we can ask questions about the documents once they're projected into this space. So, um, so this, this is a lot, this, this, I know that this image has a lot of information in it. And so if anybody has any questions about it, um, then feel free to, to chime in. So the A, B, C, D, those are, uh, are those categories? Those or? are the vocabulary words. Vocabulary words. Okay. So, so that would be your dictionary. So any any word that happens in your corpus, yeah. uh, I just happened to choose A, B, C, and D. Uh, oh, okay. It could have been like cat, camel, dog, oh, okay. giraffe. And X, Y, and Z are the topics. And X, Y, and Z are our topics. Yeah. Oh, okay. And they're completely independent. Yeah. And they, well, they're, uh, the top, yeah, so the top, the, there is a, the question is, what should those topics end up being? And that's what the fitting process. Ah. For, for no, that's topics. interesting. So the, can the topics be back in the dictionary too? Or is, is there any? The topics are composed of dictionary words. Got it, right. So yeah. there, would be, there would be that weird sort of. Yeah, but, uh, but for instance, if you, had, if you had exactly the same number of words as you had <laughs> topics, then what you would have is a multinomial that just had a, one, a single bar. Oh, shit. And so it would also be a bijection too. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, and so you would like, and you would like to fit that. Yeah, so there's, so there's definitely, um, and and so as you, you always want to have fewer topics than you have words, uh, because you want to like, fit, but you also, uh, it's it's cool to be able to have, I guess, understanding that relationship it can take a bit of time, I and mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of value in exploring that space. Yes, I will. Yeah, so there's a question asked, are you going to talk about how LDA was used at NASA? Um, yes, I will be talking about that. Um, because I actually used a model called the author topic model, which mm. is in this class of models. Mm. Um, and so we'll, we'll be getting to that, I think, soon. Uh, What's P in, in the, the title above? It says Beijing extension to PLSA. Oh, yeah, so I have some of these like annotations on the top. Uh, so PLSA. It, it's nobody uses it, um, but it is the predecessor to late Dirichlet allocation model. If you decide to do reading about this, then the first thing you're going to get introduced to in topic modeling is a is a, is a machine called latent latent semantic analysis, and then uh, uh, okay. to put Bayesian priors on latent semantic analysis creates PLSA, and then to um, no longer require that topics are orthogonal is what latent Dirichlet allocation gives you. Which, and so there's a bunch of math into why that is, but it's, uh, uh, that, that's, what, that's what that note, note is about. So for instance, here's the, uh, one of the cases that we were looking at for, um, so the, the actual, I'll start by describing the data set that we were operating on for this. The data set was, um, uh, failure reports okay. for uh, late stage anomalies or, or late stage missions. What's apophenia? Uh, apophenia is the ability to, or is the is the um, is when your 
your brain makes uh, identifies patterns that aren't actually there. Ah, okay, got it. Okay. Um, so uh, the so uh, the, so what was happening was there's like a satellite or there is a um, uh, so let's just, let's say there's a satellite that's launched in space and it starts reporting weird values, weird numbers, and now we need to quickly assign an engineer to um, uh, try to address that concern, uh, either by submitting a software patch or by uh, understanding whether those are actual physical anomalies or whether they are not, all of these different things. Uh, and so one of the first tasks is to take all of those anomalies and express them as topics. Um, because then we can more quickly understand what types of errors uh, different missions have. So um, what we see here is that uh, in these three topics that are real topics from uh, the, uh, the problem reporting system at JPL was uh, this, uh, this one is about uh, connecting to networks. Um, this one is about uh, physical instruments in anomaly recovery. So it's not a great informative topic, but it is a topic. And then this one is about the deep space network, which is what this DSM is and the hopping station. So the deep space network is a set of, um, uh, well, I guess, uh, uh, terrestrial satellite dishes for communicating with, um, with probes out in space. So each of these three topics in your topic space is composed of six words in your dictionary space. Actually, it's composed of all of the words in my dictionary space, but these are the most prevalent words. Okay. So, so uh, just like we saw in this, um, this distribution, each one of these topics has all five words represented, A, B, C, and D, but by different amounts. And so uh, we would say that topic Y is a B, E topic, and topic okay. Z is a uh, CD. CD. <laughs> yeah. Forgot the labels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so, let's see here. And so, the, you do have to be aware that sometimes people find patterns that aren't there, but uh, at the end of the day, um, having the models, uh, or I guess, uh, that, that there are ways to evaluate whether topics are unique, and there are ways to um, Kind of explore the space in a more uh, and, and what you do find often is that topics are informative. You just don't always necessarily know immediately why. Quick time check, about ten minutes or so. Oops, ten minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I should don't need that much. Yeah. Um, so uh, as an application that I used, there so there are a bunch of different uh, uh, models based on latent Dirichlet allocation. There is, for instance, the NAD boosted topic model, which I, I briefly mentioned about on my work with clinical trial data. Um, there is the author topic model, which tries to model authors as a mixture of topics and documents as, the, as a mixture of the same topics in order to um, be able to relate authors to, or uh, um, I guess, uh, identify expertise in a list of authors. Um, and then there's here at higher Dirichlet processes, which try to look at um, uh, uh, very specifically, uh, so, so I guess constantly nested, um, uh, I guess hierarchical uh, topics or hierarchical questions for this type of model. Um, and what we see here, and although these aren't always fun to read, these plate diagrams, um, uh, the models look very similar. We can see that, that over here, uh, number one or number letter A is latent Dirichlet allocation as described by a plate model. And then there's an author model, which is just to say that we only want to uh, model authors but not topics. And we can say that a document has multiple authors. And then we uh, build a Dirichlet distribution over our authors. Or we can say here, which was the author topic model, which was to look at um, authors as a mixture of topics and documents as a mixture of topics and words picked from those topics. Mm. So, um, and you'll find that if you go down the rabbit hole of research papers in this space, uh, all of these uh, plate diagrams look very, very similar and usually have this stepping stone approach where they say, first I had the LDA and then I had this modification I wanted to make and this is how I combined the two, which is really nice. I'm going to sound stupid, but what's a plate diagram? A plate, it's a, um, it's like a, 
a summary. It's a, it's just a, a way to, to do so. So I guess in this case we have um, this is the generative model. This is a way to annotate the generative model. We can say that um, for the author model, a author is observed, it's shaded, and a word is observed because it's shaded. And there are uh, a certain number of authors per document and a certain number of words per document, which is what these plates are that, that denote replication. So, that, so this is uh, this is just a way to describe an entity yeah. relationship. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, yeah, it's like a On relationship steroids. between between probability distributions. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Ah. And so the thing that isn't notated here is that uh, um, is that these are uh, sampled from a multinomial or near shade distribution, or that they are priors. So, can you do without? This is really naive, but it's it's like a, a entity relation diagram for distributions, where the distributions are the entities. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And then your errors denote dependence. Ah, excellent. So, uh, okay. So, um, ooh, cool. This is the actual project that I did. Um, so I mentioned that the uh, goal of this project was to look at the um, late stage uh, anomalies of missions. And in particular, what we were concerned with was that a, uh, we wanted to do a matchmaking problem, which is, can I identify the best engineer to solve a ticket if I only have a ticket description? Um, and this is very similar uh, to the uh, hiring, or I guess the, the, the resume problem. If you have a job description, who's the best uh, resume to match to it, or um, or who's the best engineer to match to it, you can definitely do as this problem. Um, the um, what I did was I used the author topic model because it uh, represents both. I guess let's take a quick look at um, uh, in this space. So I have this this weird looking block over here. In my original drawing, this had authors as well. And so what we're doing is we're picking authors and we're picking topics and they back to the same spaces. We can ask questions like, what is the distance between this author's expertise and this document? And that's effectively how I ended up modeling. Oops. Um, so putting an author and a document both on this dear Schley space and then saying, what is the distance between those two spaces? And that's how we ended up modeling uh, expertise of an engineer. And so this was a task that usually had been done on the order of um, uh, weeks to months um, because uh, identifying what is wrong and then getting that propagated through the right channels was all done by humans. There wasn't any like automation process. And, uh, and so this, uh, this tool was able to, with, uh, within the first 15 results, always identify the engineer who had uh, close the tickets, the engineers who had closed the tickets um, for uh, each, um, not always, but at a high, high accuracy, um, for each of the, um, the training and test sets. In a runtime of what, typically? Uh, very quickly. Like yeah. microseconds? Yeah, microseconds. Yeah. <laughs> That's it wasn't, amazing. Yeah, it wasn't worth the uh, timing. Right, exactly. Time. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Outstanding. So, uh, Although I don't have a code demo, what I do have is this. Uh, this is a public project. I got uh, permission when I when I left to make sure that it could be public. Um, and uh, this uh, is kind of a a way to look at configuring a author topic model for this sort of a problem. Um, what I have is you describe, you name your document type, and then you uh, have a configuration for that document type. In this case, it was the, uh, uh, oh, I don't know what GIF on is anymore. Um, <laughs> it was some internal acronym of some sort. But um, the location for that document, uh, in this implementation, I only support CSVs, but there is uh, there was interest in having us have a provider that allowed for different types of connections. Um, and then, for each of the CSV uh, rows, these are the free text rows that are inter we're interested in analyzing. Uh, this is the key that denotes the document, unique document ID. Uh, this is uh, a list of all of the uh, experts or all of the authors that we were concerned about and, uh, and then describes their expert key, which is their user ID and um, 
their names and uh, organization number. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then furthermore, I have this, uh, so part of the problem with your lay allocation is that you usually have to go through this step of identifying all of your stop words and your- Stop um, words? Stop words are words like the and, oh, and, and the kind of words, yeah, you know, prepositions, anything that is very, very common, like actually NASA became a stop word <laughs> because it's in every single document. They also had a couple of other contractors that became stop words, those oh, weren't informative words. And so you, what you do is you usually ask, what is the most common word in my document? Uh, the most common 10%, the most, least common 10% is a, is a good rough uh, guess, but um, there are definitely more informed ways to make those decisions. Um, so a few, few more minutes. Okay, uh, so you can specify um, like what regular expressions you want to exclude from all your documents, what are the words you don't want to have uh, modified, what are your stop words, and then a dictionary of all words for which you can apply things like stemming to um, and, and lemmatization, either of those strategies for uh, reducing your vocabulary size. And then you specify your number of topics and the number of iterations you want to be training your model on. And this program will actually uh, take all of that information and produce a website um, that allows for you to do your, um, qu your uh, queries by just typing in a, uh, something that uh, corresponds to your free text fields. Um, so uh, if anybody wants to play with this and anybody has questions about this, feel free to send like uh, issue requests about it or, or contact me. It's, uh, it's fun to play with. Um, it, there's definitely a little bit of uh, engineering that goes involved and in, like understanding how many topics is a, uh, a, a non-trivial question. Uh, usually what I tell people is that there are several metrics for topic modeling and um, the, ones to, the one to use is coherence. There's like uh, coherence, generality, and uh, perplexity are the three common evaluation metrics and for uh, topic modeling coherence is the one that has most human interpretable results. Coherence, what one? Generality and perplexity. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, but also I used. Uh, is there a pre processing pipeline to get the, the CSV data filled from the documents or something, the chapter one? Uh, so, no, I, so I assume that you, that you have the ability to take your documents. Them into CSVs that describe, okay. yeah. So you have to have uh, named columns that describe your, your CSVs. But once you have that, uh, which you can usually export from a database, or you can get from, uh, you can go from JSON to CSV pretty easily, okay. things like that. Um, these are all things that are should be pretty doable. Um, and so I guess that uh, if anybody's got any questions. That's good.